day. If you're nailing your sleep and you're nailing your nutrition and then you want to add other things in or take them out, just do one at a time. The activation work um, through the lower limb um, is, a, is a really good option. How can I help people? How can I um, you know, make the impact? It does sound corny and very cliche, but um, they're the things that probably got me going. And then as long as it's not a tendon that's a tendon involved, you can generally go to some longer muscle lengths early, uh, try and strengthen there, and then make sure you've got sufficient strength before you really go past it. Um, in a professional sense. Um, yeah, a lot of sort of sink or swim moments, and yeah, I think that's probably been one of the yeah, greatest challenges, but equally one of the most rewarding as well. During that sort of six to seven years, have there been, have you sort of refined the methods to transfer it to more AFL appropriate? Like you mentioned some guys with shoulder issues um, or maybe wrist issues that, that don't partake, but what about the guys that do? Um, how is it different to what you see on, on YouTube, like you mentioned? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of floor-based work in terms of crawl mobility crawls um rolling um some sort of rolling and tackle technique work um and obviously back in the day we do a little bit more sort of floor-based mobility and and stretching um whereas we found this is a bit of bit of both so you're getting a bit more bang for your buck in terms of efficiency a lot of the guys are all about getting in and out these days at the club so if you can if you can throw in a, a drill where they're crawling through range and you're actually getting some good hip mobility work as well as upper body weight bearing proprio work all in the one exercise um it's actually it transfers pretty well and that's become part of our sort of pre-training routine if i'm working with this club for instance you know our guys aren't professional athletes you know they're not spending time in the gym and as much time on recovery um, do you have any advice for, you know, trying to get the best bang for your buck? So working with a big group who, you know, yep. they're working nine to five and, and just getting to training on time. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Some of these drills uh, could be used as, a, in, as part of the warm-up. So some pre-training activation work um, through the lower limb um, is, a, is a really good option. Um, and then post-training body weight. Um, conditioning, particularly hamstring strength work, so some of the Nordic work that they that they do, um, easily something you could you could all get the guys to just do some partner Nordics, helping um, holding onto each other's ankles and um, doing some reconditioning at the end of training, um, and then it's yeah, then it becomes a bit about about the buy-in. So what the culture's like around their gym and strength conditioning work outside of on-field training. West Coast program, take us through sort of um, how, how did you, like what would be a typical day? Was it more fly on the wall stuff? Was it assisting with rehab? Were there um, some roles and responsibilities that you had or was it more just sort of uh, case by case depending on what was going on in the day? You know, to summarise it, I suppose, for you and keep it relatively brief, their players in the reserves would play at East Perth with me on the weekend. I'd do a bit of a handover back to the Eagles medical staff, um, you know, after that on the Saturday night and then I'd come in on the Monday and kind of watch them, the doctors, physios assess what they thought about the injury, I suppose. Um, and then I'd help out like a lot of prac students do, whether it's s &C or physio, whether it's strapping ankles in a physio sense or helping with the screening or being an extra in a rehab drill or those kind of things. How often would you recommend a development athlete to try something and then reflect on it and recognise, okay, that's not, I'm going to bin that one and I'm going to move on to the next one. Is it three times? Is there, is there a certain number or, do you, or is another one of those ones that's sort of once you get it a couple of goes and then go off your gut feeling? Yeah, I think your gut feeling will tell you quite a bit, but probably the main thing with that is you only try one thing new at a time. At what age did you discover you had a, uh, a passion for, for performance, but also specifically in your area of, of physio and medicine? Um, I think it's like every physio, um, physio's um, journey. I think I played sport, um, got injured, had good and bad experiences. Um, so from there, obviously, the physio side of things kicked in. 
Um, I think, you know, come year 10, 11, 12, um, and played football at an okay level. But um, I think when it all kind of came together was obviously um, football stopped, but then you're trying to go, okay, cool, what do I want to do? Um, and it, yes, of course, you want to still be involved with sport. It stops, but then, you know, it sounds pretty corny, but as a physio, or being a physio, I was looking forward to actually, you know, help. How can I help people? How can I, um, you know, make the impact? It does sound corny and very cliche, but um, they're the things that probably got me going. And then obviously being in sport, I'm um, involved in sport all my life. I'm like, okay, what's, what's another way to continue being involved in, you know, something that I'm passionate in and obviously that's sport. So that linked yeah. up really well. And I think physio kicked in to help people in a career in medicine and, you know, with, with a um, window to grow and become more. Um, was mm-hmm. the path, and then obviously sport kicked in. Was obviously like you know, um, any, any every male and female, you love it. And h- how do I bring that into my workplace? And it kind of all kind of fell together, mate. So um, that's how um, physio came in the picture. The um, I didn't get a UAI or ATAR of ninety nine, unfortunately. So I yeah. um, went the long way, which was um, a good journey. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nice. And can you recall the first physio that? Um, either worked with you as an athlete or, or that you um, that you met? Um, yeah, um, <laughs> Bruno Vidage and um, Adrian Vidage. I wouldn't say, um, looking back now, I had the best management. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think I'd, when I played, um, you know, football, or soccer, as we call it, um, oh, I didn't have the best management. And that's probably purely why um, I think um, it made me itch to kind of be in the sport end or highest performance end of things. Um, yeah. Because, uh, and in the football world, um, I personally think um, the side of physio sometimes back in those kind of days, not saying that old, but was missed. is a lot of soft tissue. Yeah, jump on the bed, give you a flush, give you some you know static stretches and off you go. Um, play the sport. I'll bring the ice spray as well. Sure, you've seen the yeah. spray come out in the Euro Euros. Um, so stuff like that, obviously, um, burnt a hole in how I wanted to practice physio and where I thought was a gap. And obviously, the industry is changing um, year by year, and so it's moving in the right direction. So yeah, and I think that's how physio happened. Obviously, working with multiple different physios, which obviously we'll get to, but um, they're the ones that probably have polished me in a way of a physio that I want to become and um, continue um, growing to. So yeah. Been one of your biggest challenges that you've faced, and and um, what did you learn from it? Um, I think I, I think you know honestly, probably the move to the UK was was a big one with a young family and wife and the unknown um, going into a, a fairly what is a traditionally fairly volatile sort of industry, and again coming from outside of um, the sport. Um, I think it's probably the hardest but best thing I've ever done in a professional sense. Um, yeah, a lot of sort of sink or swim moments. And um, yeah, I think that's probably been one of the yeah, greatest, I suppose, challenges, um, but equally one of the most rewarding as well. If you're taking a player through a hamstring rehabilitation, is, you know, um, is that an area that you do more research on because that's it's specific to your role in that position or like you mentioned how high performance culture is something you're interested in the moment so we read a book on that like is it it's quite specific or is it more just general in how you upskill yourself over, over your career yeah um i suppose I've, I've never really been strategic about it but you know probably like yourself you know like your offerings with social media podcasts um you know, twitter even um that sort of thing, but probably the big thing is 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 actually engaging with with people. And you know, I think I touched on it earlier that generally speaking, most people are pretty willing to to pick up the phone or reply to an email, um, especially in AFL circles. You know, with, we've got a great cohort, as you know, of strength and conditioning coaches and and, and physios that you know, it's a, you're only a phone call away. And in that reporting, uh, keeping your records process so you've got like the qualitative data i imagine and then what sort of quantitative stuff are you noting are you noting things like how the athlete is presenting from a mood point of view or is it more screening information and and sort of your subjective view on things what do you think is important for practitioners to know um during the rehab process yeah look i think you know there's high scrutiny in afl especially so you know your objective data is pretty easy to, to come by um 
yeah, it's abundant. It's um, there's lots of it. I probably lean more towards the sub- subjective stuff. You know, those discussions you have with the athlete, with other practitioners, those sorts of things. Um, just that mud mapping of ideas, I think, is really important. Um, and yeah, that's the stuff I lean on probably more so. The goals for each stage that you're in. Um, so if you're in the early stages, knowing when to start your, your strengthening work, um, uh, when you can start to, to kind of run fast, that type of thing. Um, but I was giving some practical stuff. I'd just say um, uh, start loading. Um, if you can start, as long as it's not a tendon that's, that's in, involved, you can generally go to some longer muscle lengths early, uh, try and strengthen there, and then make sure you've got sufficient strength before you really go fast. Awesome, mate. Thank you. I'm sure that's a massive help. And um, the, the Is there things that you've seen over your time, like whether it be hamstring strains or, or, or groin injuries, whatever it might be, that you've seen um, a lot of change in the way things are, um, are dealt with in terms of management? I think hamstrings definitely. Like I think we're a lot more um, uh, aggressive and confident to be aggressive now, um, mm-hmm. um, but also knowing when to, to not be. Mm-hmm.